Thank you, everybody. Um, just give me one second here. Uh, thank, I want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, as one of our, one of our Boston's finest just pointed out, sun's out today. It's nice to see the sun. And I'm hoping if you're out, you're wearing a, a mask and physical distancing as you move forward here. But I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, the latest numbers as of yesterday, don't have today's numbers yet, uh, 58,302 cases of COVID-19 uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, 3,153 people have lost their life. In Boston, 8,613 cases of COVID-19, and 333 people have lost their life here in the city of Boston. Uh, I want everyone to remember that behind each of the numbers of somebody who's lost a loved one, uh, there's a family. I'd like to ask you to keep them in your thoughts and prayers uh, as we go through this um, tough time here in Boston, Massachusetts, and in the country, in the world, quite honestly. Uh, today I'll be sharing updates on access to the COVID test, uh, new, res new Boston Residency Fund grants, and relief for residents and small businesses struggling with housing payments and other bills that they have. Uh, first, I want to just address the governor's announcement yesterday. Uh, the governor's state, the, the state extended its stay-at-home advisory uh, in essential service order to May 18th. Uh, the governor also appointed a reopening advisory board made up of public health, state and local government officials and private industry leaders. Uh, that board is tasked with producing uh, guidance by May 18th for a phase reopening based on public health data. These goals are consistent with the principles we have established here in uh, the city in my administration and I am pleased to pledge our full participation uh, in the governor's process. Uh, as the state's capital city and economic engine, we have been developing a recovery framework for city government, private industry, and also nonprofits. We're going to continue those conversations with public health experts and leaders in the different sectors of our local economy, and we look forward to sharing our ongoing work and insight with the Governor's Advisory Board, um, and also working with other mayors and cities and towns in Massachusetts as well. Uh, we're collectively sharing ideas and, and information as we continue to move forward here. Uh, as a member of the 17-person board is my chief of staff, Catherine Burton, uh, will be the point person for coordinating the state and city's reopening framework. Uh, our goals are a healthy reopening and an equitable recovery for all of our residents, our businesses, and our institutions. Uh, this certainly can't be done in isolation. We must move forward together, and I appreciate uh, the governor, uh, his thoughtfulness in, in, in taking this approach. Uh, I should also mention that in regard to the May 18th date, the Boston Public Health Commission, uh, the public health emergency is in effect until further notice. Uh, the advisory curfew has been extended to May 18th, and all of our measures will continue to be guided by local public health data uh, and expert advice. The, expert, the experts are clear. Uh, the key to recovery is testing. We continue to expand testing across our city with new test sites in our neighborhoods. Uh, just one example of the impact this is having at the Codman Square Health Center, the support, with the support in the city provided uh, results of a 73% increase in testing this week over last week. Um, that 73% is, is a small number, but it's, it's, it's more testing. And our goal is to get to more testing than we're doing right now. Um, but the testing that we're doing now and the information we're getting is making a difference in, in people's lives, uh, just, not just in Dorchester where Carbon Square Health Center is, but all across the city. This week, we're, we're drawing on the Boston Resiliency Funds to support the COVID testing at more community health centers. Uh, those health centers are going to include the Fenway uh, Health in the Fenway neighborhood, Driscoll and the Ponset Health Center in Dorchester, the Charles River Community Health Center in, in Brighton. Uh, when they're up and running, we'll have a total of 19 total sites operating in the city of Boston. Uh, 14 of them will be in our health centers and five will be in our hospitals. Uh, you can find locations and hours and, and contact information for all open sites on our, our map at boston.gov slash coronavirus. Uh, we're also going to continue to do universal testing in our homeless population, uh, both in city-run and non-profit shelters. Uh, I can also confirm that our antibody testing initiative for 1,000 residents is underway. We aim to complete it by the end of the week. Uh, participants will be also tested for the presence of the COVID virus. That's going to give us a snapshot of how, we, how, how prevalent the outbreak is in certain zip codes in our city uh, and to improve the picture of how the virus is, being, is spreading. 
My administration is working coordinating this project. I'm grateful to the folks at the Mass General Hospital, Dr. Peter Slavin and his team, for providing a world-class level of quality control and medical science on this testing. I'm also grateful to the residents who have agreed to participate. In addition to providing valuable data, this program allows us to empower 1,000 residents with the knowledge about their own situation. The Boston Resiliency Fund has played an essential role in our city's response to the public health crisis. We created the fund to get resources quickly to organizations that serve uh, people with the deepest needs. Food and for children and seniors, child care and other supports for health care, first responders and essential workers, technology for at-home learning for our low-income families, and it quickly became clear that in, that this would be an effective resource to make testing more equitable and more available across our neighborhoods. So far, we've raised $27.4 million from nearly 5,000 donors. Those are remarkable figures, and we continue to take donations. We've already distributed over $13.8 million to 138 different organizations in Boston. Today, we're awarding an additional $1.4 million to 19 different organizations. They include community health centers to expand testing, as I mentioned before. They also include sizable grants to the Greater Boston Food Bank that has been doing an amazing job. Um, and you can donate directly to the food bank if you'd like as well to, uh, to help them keep their, start, their shelves full of food. Um, we're also funding trusted local food providers in Dorchester and Roxbury and Mattapan. Organizations serving seniors, serving homelessness, homeless individuals, serving immigrant communities with culturally appropriate food and services. I want to thank our steering committee for guiding this work every single day with every single donor that comes through. All the organizations serving our vulnerable neighbors in a time of need, I want to thank you for that. Friday is May 1st, and I know that many people are worried about paying their bills, including renters, homeowners, and small businesses. So I want to share some, some updates on relief for housing payments and other needs. Our Renter Relief Fund made $3 million available to renters who lost their income and can't access unemployment benefits. Uh, a lot of people are applying to that, but these are for folks that do not have access to unemployment benefits uh, and have no other income coming in. Our nonprofit partners are currently processing, processing 800 applications for rental assistance. And we've launched $2 million small business relief funds for businesses impacted by this crisis. By the end of this week, we'll have distributed 83% of those funds to over 500 businesses in the city of Boston. Today, we secured over $10 million in federal funding that we'll be able to use to resupply those programs and meet other essential needs. So question has come up, what happens when these programs run out of money and we're working to try and replenish these programs? I want to remind everyone that the state passed legislation to protect renters and homeowners from losing their homes. If you can't pay your rent or mortgage, you have options. We're asking you to reach out to your landlord or your bank to tell them about your situation and ask them what they can do to help. For small businesses, these funds will allow us to fulfill the eligible and approved grant requests that we have received in the in, in industries most impacted by COVID-19. Uh, more information will be coming. A few weeks ago, I announced a foreclosure prevention plan for mortgage lenders. Partic participating lenders agreed to defer mortgage payments for at least three months and more if necessary, and not to report late payments to credit rating agencies and to provide scheduled repayment, plan repayment plans. We started with 12 leading banks and lenders. Since then, others have joined the agreement, including the Boston Firefighters Credit Union and, and, and also the Mass Housing and Mass Housing Partnership on our home ownership programs. Today, I can announce two additional banks that have signed on to our plan, Leader Bank and Berkshire Bank. I want to thank them. We now have 17 lenders on board. Once again, if you're having difficulty paying your mortgage, make sure you reach out to your lender. These programs are in place, but they ha you have to reach out to them. If you wait two or three months and you want to access the program after it's over, uh, there's a chance you won't be able to do that. If you feel like you need more help and you're not sure what to do, we're asking you to call the Boston Home Center at 617-635-HOME. That's 617-635-HOME. An update on food access. Food is not only a necessity, it's a major, major budget item for many people, many families. We're committed to providing free meals to everyone who needs them. We have 65 youth-orientated sites operated by the Boston Public Schools, 
Boston Center for Youth and Families, the Boston Housing Authority, and a range of trusted partners. They have served over half a million meals already. Seven of our meal sites are now serving adults, focusing on neighborhoods with the greatest needs. And these are the ones we've heard from. The newest one opened today at the East Boston Social Center. And tomorrow we'll have an eighth site coming online at the Boston Housing Authority's Alice Taylor Apartments in Roxbury. You can find meal sites and a range of other food resources at boston.gov slash coronavirus or by calling 311. Internet access is also an essential need, especially in this crisis, and especially for our, for our students in our schools. We have distributed over 30,000 free Chromebook laptops, 2,400 free Wi-Fi spots to get families of the BPS students online and also charter schools as well. These resources are still available. To request a Chromebook, go to bostonpublicschools.org or call 311 if you don't have one for your child or if your computer is broken down. Some of the kids didn't need a Chromebook. They had their own technology in the homes. And sometimes what happens over time, if your technology goes down, you, can, you should reach out to the Boston Public Schools. As Boston Public Schools introduces the next phase of home learning, uh, these are vital, important resources. To request, request Wi-Fi, excuse me, we're asking you to contact your child's school directly. So if you have a child, you contact the school that your child goes to for, for support and help around Wi-Fi. We are committed to getting all the resources into the hands of every student that needs them in Boston. For those who already have service, Boston Internet and wireless providers agreed to suspend service cutoffs and late fees through the months of March and April. I'm pleased that Verizon, Comcast, and RCN have now extended that pledge through June 30th, and I want to thank you for doing that. Uh, before I take questions, I want to remind everyone of the steps that we should be taking every day to protect ourselves and to protect each other and to protect our community. We're asking you people to wash your hands as frequently as possible with warm water and soap. Keep practicing physical distancing when you're out walking. Um, what, what's happening is people, so you see a friend you haven't seen in a while, you stop and you talk, there's two of you, and then another couple of people come over, they stop and talk, and now there's four or five and six of you in a group. We're asking you to just kind of give a wave and, and keep moving forward. Stay in uh, whenever possible when you're not uh, going out for essential items like groceries or, or, or um, prescriptions or going for a walk. Anytime you leave your home, um, or you're near other people, you should be wearing a face covering. We're asking people to do that. Uh, I want to send, a, in the last couple of days, uh, I was talking to different neighborhood organizations last night on Zoom calls, and I want to send a special message to runners and cyclists. Um, even though you're exercising, you need to be wearing a face covering when you're out exercising. For those already that are doing it, I want to thank you for it. I can't tell you how many runners and bikers I see breathing heavily and blowing right past people with no face covering. This is not considerate to the people around you, and I understand why it's making people angry. It's sending the message that you're not necessarily concerned about them in the community. I know you are, and to be clear, if you don't, um, if you don't know if you're infected or not, you can be passing the virus to other people. Other people have no idea whether you had the virus or you didn't have the virus. This is a precaution that we all have to take to protect each other. I understand it takes getting used to it. I know when you're running, it's an inconvenience. I get that in riding a bike. But it's important that if you're far enough from other people, you can pull it down under your chin for a while, and then that's fine. But you must have it on covering your nose and mouth when you are anywhere near other people as you're passing. The more people who do it, the fewer infections we get. When we talk about waiting for um, an, um, a drug to cure it or, or, or a drug that can stop it, the best thing we can do right now is to uh, prevent it from spreading. And you do it by social physical distancing, by wearing a mask, by washing down surfaces, by washing your hands. All of those things is 100% proven fact that we can spot the, stop the spread of the virus ourselves. Another important reminder, if you're having mild symptoms consistent with the coronavirus, we're asking you to call 311 or help your doctor or 311 helpline. Um, some concerns that I know the medical professional has, medical profession has, and the governor talked about this yesterday and the, and the day before, and I talked about it two days ago. If you're having, in a, medical, if you're having a medical emergency of any kind and, and you don't want to call 911 and you don't want to go to the doctor because you're not sure, I'm asking you to call 911. 
That includes difficulty breathing, pains in your chest, signals of stroke, or any, any other signs that you're concerned about. We have the capacity to treat everyone who needs care here in the city of Austin. And that also applies to anyone who feels threatened by violence in, in their home or outside or aware of any abuse going on. We're asking you to call 911. Finally, I want to close again with a thank you for some of the unsung heroes in this crisis. We can't thank our healthcare workers and first responders enough. We're hearing the stories on TV and watching them on TV and on the radio and reading about them in the newspaper. And there's so many essential workers that are stepping up for our community right now here in the city of Boston. Today, I want to thank some of the folks that are behind the scene, the workers behind the scene, the custodians, the janitors, the maintenance crew, all the people who are cleaning and disinfecting essential workplaces every single day during this crisis. Here at City Hall, the custodial crew in the property management department is disinfecting every workspace and public area every single day. City workers are cleaning police stations, firehouses, um, meal sites, you name it, they're cleaning it. I want to thank them for that. Also, every single day, hospital cleaning staff are going into emergency departments, intensive care units, bathrooms, public areas, disinfecting them. Every single day at Boston Hope Medical Center, every single day at community health centers, every single day in grocery stores and pharmacies, in coffee shops, in every place that's keeping us going and getting us through this, people are working hard to clean it and prevent infection. They're doing some of the most daunting and necessary work in our city right now, every day around the clock to keep us safe. They have children. They have elderly parents. They are from every racial and ethnic community in our community. They truly are unsung heroes. So on behalf of the city of Boston, I want to thank all of them for your incredible work. Uh, I have a couple questions here that were pre sent in, and then I'll open up to the, the press that's here today. Uh, from Boston 25, Robert Goulston, as barber shops and hair salons prepare to reopen, what will some of the protocols being considered that they can start to prepare so they can be ready? For example, should they reconfigure chairs for space, put up plexiglass between chairs, begin to purchase face masks, etc.? I know that some of the essential businesses, such as grocery stores, have already instituted changes like the ones that Robert mentioned. As I spoke earlier, the City of Boston is participating in the state's advisory board and reopening, and I'm sure interventions and protocols will be discussed as we look at phases of reopening in the City of Boston and statewide. I'd also like to ask if um, companies have recommendations, you can email us our, our website and give us some recommendations on what recommendations you'd like to see as far as reopening. Nick from Boston.com. Does the mayor have any response to President Trump's suggestion that the states may not get as much funding unless local sanctuary cities' policies are changed? And is he concerned about Trump's comments, what could mean for Boston and Massachusetts? Uh, as I said throughout this entire uh, pandemic, this is important for elected officials and leaders to work together for us to get through this very difficult time. These suggestions or threats by the White House are uncalled for. They're not going to solve either the public's health or the immigration challenge that we have in our country. This is not the time to politicize issues to push forward an agenda. People are hurting, people are dying, people are scared. This is the time for leadership. And that's exactly what we're going to provide here in Massachusetts and the city of Boston. And that's my suggestion that Washington should start doing, providing some leadership for the people of America. Uh, with that, I will open up to any questions you have. Just building on that question about the sanctuary city, you worry that Boston might pay the price? No, no. I mean, Right now, the response that the federal government has, has, has shown on getting PPE and testing out, um, I don't know how much slower they can go on some of this stuff, so I'm not concerned about that. The, the question was, uh, am I worried about um, Boston paying the price on the sanctuary uh, city um, talk by the president? Um, quite honestly, it's, it's a political, every time the president uh, gets his back up against the wall, he pulls out the sanctuary city card and talks about immigration. And I think he should focus on what's in front of us, the COVID-19, uh, where, where I think it's, uh, we have 2 million Americans now have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, we're, we're a third of the world's population as far as the test positive for COVID-19. Uh, we have challenge in front of us. We should focus on COVID-19. Uh, and then when, when that is complete, we should be challenged on how do we open up America again, uh, not focus an immigration uh, policy that's that's a fair tactic. Were you surprised that immigration even got sort of wrapped up? No, not at all. Not with, not with, not with him. Any other questions?
Thank you. Uh, this is a, not a question but from, a, from a private citizen that's here with us today. Uh, wanted me to give a shout out to the Boston Medical Center and Tufts Medical Center uh, for their incredible work. Um, she is formerly a guest at Rosie's Place, and she wants to thank Rosie's Place as well in the system in place. And they, they, they helped her with the COVID-19, and we're glad that she's here with us this morning and, and uh, very grateful to Rosie's Place, Boston Medical Center, and Tufts Medical Center. Thank you for that. All right, anything else? All right, thank you, everybody. Have a good day.